All right. So, one of the first questions is uh, something which uh, you know people have been asking about the whole idea of logical effort, right? In fact, so the uh, basic setup is something like this, right? The question is, under what conditions does that fan out of four become relevant, right? When do you actually think about that? When do you make use of it? Okay, and why is it required at all? Is it that in all cases you need to have exactly a fan out of four, or is it only when you know? you use that as a sort of useful guideline in certain situations that's basically the question right so what it boils down to is this the most fundamental thing about logical effort is simply what does it say about delay through a gate so if i have some arbitrary gate right with let's say multiple inputs but i'm concerned with one particular input output combination okay and i have some delay a delay arc which basically says okay from this input assuming that every every other input is remaining constant if this input changes in such a way that it causes a change at the output what is the delay corresponding to that and how is that related to the structure of the gate okay so there are a number of things here there might be multiple inputs i am concerned with only one of them the other inputs have to be kept fixed and fixed in such a way that the change at this input of my interest can cause a change at the output otherwise there is nothing to discuss right so for example in an and gate if one of the inputs is made zero then it doesn't matter what i do to the other input i cannot cause a change at the output right so i'm not interested in that kind of analysis i'm considering a situation where i ca can cause a change at the output and trying to measure what is the delay as a result of that okay so this particular arc right is what i'm interested in and what i'm saying is the delay through this can be encapsulated using this equation g into h plus p right where g is purely a property of the structure of the gate and p is again a property of the structure of the gate right h alone is the actual implementation scenario right actually load dependent okay so the g and p only depend on whether it's a nand gate or a not gate or a or gate or whatever type of gate it is that you are trying to implement okay and what we are saying is it need not i am not assuming that h has to be an integer i am not assuming that g has to be some specific value Uh, like 4 by 3 or something of that sort it is actually something which pretty much what i do is i vary the external load plot the delay as a function of the external load take h as external load divided by input capacitance as a normalizing ratio and whatever is that remaining slope that is my logical effort okay so you will always end up with delay which looks something like this right so this is the delay through the circuit this is h now the question is how exactly do i define h it's equal to cl divided by ci this part of it i need to be careful about how exactly i compute it right but you can do that for every gate you know what its input capacitance is that can be measured by other means by simulations and so on right by the way just to add one more thing i think as far as the assignment uh, was or rather for the standard cell characterization there is the question of how do you compute ci i believe there was a slight bit of confusion there given that you are dealing with fairly complex cells we need not go for this thing that you know use use the multiple cells in cascade kind of uh, approach right you remember that when when we initially talked about how do we characterize delay or capacitance of an inverter what we said was you take five inverters in a chain right and you measure the delay through the middle inverter because that is what allows the input to be shaped properly as well as the output load to be correctly balanced right now doing that for a more complex gate can become fairly difficult okay so as far as the standard cell characterization is concerned we will take a simplified approach and say okay we don't want to do that we will just take a single stage connect a known load at the output plot this as the you know essentially and for different values of load find out what is the delay and also use this in order to estimate what is the input capacitance of the cell okay you can do it in a simplified manner in other words 
Okay, so that's a digression. The point is, as far as logical effort is concerned, this is it. The slope is G. H is that factor which is basically the how big is the external load compared to the self input capacitance. And P is this offset. Okay. Now, given this, what we are saying is, supposing I have a chain of gates, all right, before getting to a chain of arbitrary gates, let me clearly look at a chain of inverters, okay, or buffers to start with, right. What I am saying is, I have some permitted input load, okay. I have a black box over here that I need to fill in with appropriate inverters and I have to drive an external capacitance. Okay, so this CI is fixed. Okay, or instead of CI, I am going to call it C0 just to show that it is the first stage. Okay, and CL is also fixed. Right? And what I the question I am asking is, how should I fill in this box in the middle with inverters so that the total delay through this chain is minimized? Okay, that is the question that I am asking. Okay, how many inverters to minimize total delay? And what should their sizes be obviously that is also a related question. Okay. Now if I pose the question in this manner, right, just arbitrarily saying okay, you need to figure out how best to drive this load, you have two variables, right. One is how many inverters should I put in, second is how big should those inverters be, right. Actually speaking you have many variables, you have n variables if you put in n inverters, but we already have some intuitive understanding that that geometric growth in the size of the inverters is what is the best way in order to get a minimum delay. Okay. So, what we are saying in other words is I will put in some number of inverters, I need to make sure that the input capacitance of the first stage is C0, that is the only thing I need to be sure of. Okay. The second stage will be presumably bigger assuming that Cl is bigger than C0, that is sort of taken for granted here. I will assume that it is going to be some f times c0. The third stage I will assume is even bigger, f square times c0 and so on. Okay. Until I end up with some f power n times c0 and finally driving cn. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, or rather call it f power n minus 1. So, that I have n stages over here. Right? So, now in this situation, we have a clear problem that there are two variables there is small f and there is small n. Right? The number of stages as well as how big should each stage be compared to the previous stage. Okay? In this situation is when you use the principle of the fan out of 4, right. How did we come up with that fan out of 4? What we did was we essentially wrote down this equation, we wrote down the delay that will result as from assuming this kind of chain, right, which will basically be that the delay through each stage is going to be f times 1 plus 1, right, through each stage multiplied by n. Okay. So, this is going to be the total delay through the circuit, total delay through the chain. And then what we said was, if we want to minimize this, subject to what? That f power n has to be equal to a constant, Cl by C0. Okay, that is the only other known factor that we have over here, f power n must be equal to Cl by C0. Given those two expressions, right, uh, f power n is equal to Cl by C0 and this delay is equal to 
f plus 1 times n and you want to minimize that you can sort of do the math and come up with this thing that the optimal value for f should be somewhere close between 3 and 4 ok that is where we chose that number 4 from it should be between 3 and 4 we chose the number 4 ok as a magic number over there we said if you don't know anything else about the circuit choose f equal to 4 as your guiding principle ok I want to make that very clear once again if you don't know anything else about the circuit you choose f is equal to 4 what is it that you could know about the circuit that will change the entire thing what can I freeze over here actual CL and C0 are given those are anyway frozen number of stages right if I tell you for example use two stages or use three stages and you are not allowed to change that then the only thing you can change is the individual sizes of the inverters how should you choose those should you still choose f is equal to 4 no then f is equal to 4 does not make sense you choose the geometric progression f is equal to cube root of n or cube root of capital F or square root of capital F or nth root of capital F where n is given to you ok if I tell you to use 10 inverters over here you take Cl by C0 to the power of 1 by 10 even though that may be nowhere close to 4 even if it is not close to 4 it will still give you the optimal delay through that chain because you are spreading the load equally across all the stages ok so in other words if the number of stages is given then the only thing that you need to do or you should be doing to optimize delay is to make sure that the sort of gain through each stage is kept the same ok that is the first part second thing is in practice you can never make the gains exactly equal right you cannot choose a inverter for example of size 3.56 what does that mean? It means that the NMOS must be 3.56 times the minimum size W, okay, which is definitely going to violate some design rule. Okay. So what do you do? You, you can go in two directions. Either you can say I will go to 3 or to 4. Okay. So in practice, you may never be able to get the exact ratios that you need. All of this is just a guideline. It is telling you that you can get close to your optimal delay by choosing these kind of numbers ok now having said all of this what happens in practice what does a real tool that is doing the synthesis for you what is it going to do right is it going to use this kind of logical effort computation in order to find out what the size of the gates should be to some extent yes but as far as the computer is concerned it need not even worry about this it need not particularly bother about you know trying to do these kind of approximate calculations and so on it can do a much more detailed arithmetic numerical calculation computation right so for example what will happen in such a situation is supposing I have a gate with some input and some output right typically what I would have is a lookup table which tells me this is my load capacitance this is my input slew and for each of those values what will the delay be ok so for our input slew equal to s1 and output capacitance equal to c1 I will end up with some number over here input slew equal to s1 and output capacitance equal to s2 I will end up with another number input slew equal to s2 output capacitance equal to s3 some other number and so on ok I can fill up this entire table that is what you are going to do as part of the project ok so what does the tool do in this case it says ok I have this chain of gates I do not particularly care about the logical effort of each one but I know that it is related to this table that I have with me right so I can sort of find out what will be the delay through this arc through this arc through this arc through this arc given that I can estimate what these capacitances are ok which means that it now becomes a more complex optimization problem I need to choose these capacitances compute the delays corresponding to them by going through this either this lookup table or some possibly even more complex 
function which determines the input output delay right and overall optimize that subject to what should the input capacitance and the final load capacitance be okay so this is what happens in practice the moment that you put a tool in there right a uh, cad tool will do most of these computations for you automatically and therefore do the optimization so why are we doing logical effort right anyway you can sort of throw the thing at the computer and it should give you an optimum result that is always true that is pretty much true of not only any kind of design process right but especially anything to do with engineering where you need to make a bunch of trade offs and optimize in general throwing the thing at the computer is probably going to give you a better result more accurate result the reason why we are studying logical effort is so that we also get an understanding of what is involved by understanding logical effort you can straight away look at parts of a circuit and know how the different optimizations should actually be happening what 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 should be the approximate sizes of gates that you see over here without even building it without even designing it you can sort of say okay i think i probably need so many inverters right or a chain of inverters over here or this kind of size of nand gate or nor gate that is important as a designer because at the end of the day you need to be able to say okay this is how big my circuit is going to be does it fit my budget is it something that i can actually build okay so that is the reason for logical effort right not that the computers themselves implement this in the exact way that we are studying in class it is more for you as a designer to understand what are the trade offs that affect your design okay most importantly you should know that if i have a small gate at the at one stage and it's trying to drive a large gate that is unreasonable yes that is obvious what is not so obvious is how can i get this small gate to drive this large gate with a minimum amount of extra area over here right the relative sizes most probably a factor of 4 increase in size is the thing that you are looking for that's where that fan out of 4 is coming from okay so just to recap fan out of 4 comes about only when you don't know two things the individual stage fan out and the number of stages if any one of them is fixed the other one can automatically be derived right in particular if the number of stages is fixed then you need to make sure that your fan out across each stage is essentially optimum for the delay don't fix fixate on that fan out of four in such a situation okay all right so that's as far as logical effort is concerned uh so by the way one small digression again over here from friday onwards uh, professor vinita vasudevan will be taking the class she'll be sort of starting with the coverage of adders and related topics okay uh, i believe she will also be using that in order to do an optimization of one part of a logical effort chain in an adder right so that might be a concrete example of where this could be used for example okay now uh another question which in fact uh, this is something that i had intended to cover initially in class but did not talk about it during the class itself is with regard to how do we distribute the clock to various parts of a circuit in such a way that the skew is not so much of a problem so first thing what is skew what we are saying is there are two flip flops both of which let's say are positive edge triggered i am sending a clock to both of them okay i don't care what the inputs are and so on my main point is the way that i have drawn this there is a certain wire which is running across on top of the substrate right most probably the clock is going to be distributed using a metal wire but it, that metal wire is going to have some thickness some width and is going to have some length depending on how far apart the two flip flops are okay because of that there will be some r and c associated with this which means that there will be some delay okay and that is where clock skew is coming from the clock which is applied to the two flip flops is skewed right it is not identical in terms of what is being applied to the two stages right how did that affect us in terms of our equations we essentially said that 
for example setup equation would mean that you know the clock at the first stage plus tc cube plus t com must be less than or equal to clock at the second stage minus t setup This is C2 is the next clock edge at second FF. Okay. Why did I decide it's the next clock edge? Because that's what I'm interested in. I want to make sure that the data which goes through the first flip flop goes through the combinational logic and can settle at the input of the second flip flop by the time it's ready to be latched in. Okay. So this is the kind of equation that we normally have. In the presence of skew, what happens? What we are saying is, the clock at the second flip-flop is not just C1 plus T clock, right? Normally, C2 will be equal to C1 plus the clock period with skew. C2 will be equal to C1 plus the clock period plus the skew, right? So in other words, this delay is what matters over here, okay? Now obviously I would like this to be as small as possible. It is possible to make use of the skew in some cases, but in general skew is undesirable, okay? Because it's sort of telling me that the placement of my flip-flops now starts to matter a great deal, especially if I'm trying to send data from one flip-flop to another. Okay. So the question becomes in such a situation, how do you actually distribute a clock to all of these flip-flops mm -hmm. in such a way that the skew to all of them is minimized? Okay. So I'm going to ask the same question with regard to what we have over here. I have two flip-flops. I have a clock input. How can I distribute the clock to both of them such that the skew is minimized? Right? What we want to do is to make sure that the distance from this common point out here to each of the flip flops is going to be equal. How would you do that? So the idea is essentially you go to the midpoint over here, okay. From here, if I could branch out like this, this means that the length of the wire to each of the flip flops from this starting point, right, is the same, right. This has to be the midpoint. Okay, this is basic geometry, right? In practice, I cannot just have wires going off at arbitrary angles. I have a so-called Manhattan grid, right? All right angles only permitted. In which case, what I will do is just modify this so that what it looks like instead is comes like this, splits here, goes to these two. Okay. By doing this, what I have ensured is that the length of the wire and therefore the capacitance, resistance and so on leading to each one of these flip flops is equal or at least approximately equal. There might be some differences because of you can't place it exactly the way that you want. Right? There might be some other obstructions or there might be some other delays. The flip flops might not be on exactly the same plane, but close enough. You can get this to the point where the skew becomes negligible compared to what it would normally have been. Okay. How do I do this if I have four flip flops? So, first question can I just do this, which is go out to the midpoint and then branch off over here? 
does this solve the problem yes no okay so this won't work why because this length is not equal to this length right so clearly this does not and it's not as simple as that right that would work only if things were placed on the perimeter of a circuit okay so what do you do instead you go hierarchical right what does that mean you first pick the overall midpoint go up to there right what i have done is after picking that midpoint i have divided the four flip flops into two groups of two each now i need to go to the midpoint of each one of those groups okay i'll take this and this as the midpoints now i can go further and split okay so for those who are those of you who might be familiar with some kind of data structures used in computing right or in in general in this kind of shape what is this it's a tree okay in particular a binary tree in this case but the binary part of it is not so important i could potentially have it as something non binary also it doesn't matter okay but it's a hierarchical tree that i have created right how do i do this in general across an entire circuit because a circuit will not have all its flip flops in one line no 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 wait so the question is you have to provide the clock to all the flip flops anyway right how much longer is this compared to just putting a straight line and taking taps from it right it is longer it is not as long as you would think at first right so you can sort of work out what is the maximum additional length that you need as a result of this right effectively what is happening is each of those branches is once again coming out you know it's sort of repeating and you have some length each of those branches in other words what i'm saying is this would have been needed anyway without possibly the vertical stages right the vertical part of it has just gone for clarity they need not be particularly long stages right but otherwise the horizontal movement over there is needed anyway simply because this is where your clock starts and that is where your last flip flop is the backwards movements are the ones which are adding length which you don't want you can put a bound on how much that is going to be, right you can sort of see how long each of those stages is going to be compared to your actual length itself it is longer yes what's the benefit that it's giving you effectively all four flip flops are seeing more or less the same clock to within a probably even a fraction of a picosecond if you do it right okay so in that sense it is worth it so ultimately it comes down to this how much skew is your circuit willing to tolerate if your circuit can tolerate a large amount of skew then yes this may not be worth it we will just go for a regular simple straight forward layout but if you do not want skew you need to do something of this sort okay how do you extend this to an arbitrary circuit which has flip flops all over the place let's say that these are the locations of the flip flops and the clock is coming in here right once again you would probably do something similar go up to the midpoint divide the entire circuit into two branch off in each direction again branch off okay so you can see that the way i have drawn it also some of the wires are not equal to others it doesn't matter the point is all of them are close enough if you really wanted them to become more equal you would need to adjust the placement of your branching points and your lengths and so on so that they all become equal in general it's possible to get very close if not exactly equal to all stages okay this kind of structure is actually it's a fractal right essentially what you are doing is you are taking something dividing it and then 
the entire process just repeats on a smaller scale right this structure is called an edge tree for obvious reasons it looks like a repeated set of edges right the letter edge right and the edge tree is one of the ways by which you can do clock delivery to all parts of the circuit okay for large circuits when you want the clock across all parts of the circuit to be the same you pretty much have to do something of this sort okay and in fact as a result of this the entire process of putting the clock in place is something which is called clock tree synthesis and in the actual process of vlsi design this is usually done at the last stage right it's not the clock tree in other words placing the clock tree figuring out where to do it has to be done only after the locations of the flip flops are known it is not something you can do before that at the same time the placement of the clock tree is very important right only by choosing it properly you can make sure that your clock skews are kept within control to all the stages that you need okay so clock tree synthesis is a sort of problem by itself okay this is one of the approaches which is used in order to distribute clocks to large circuits okay with minimum skew obviously the more skew that your circuit can tolerate the better off you are in terms of how to coordinate among the different elements okay now because of this what happens is this clock wire if you look at it is also going to see a very large load for two reasons one is the length of the wire itself the other is this one pin is connected to all the flip flops in the circuit okay potentially you could have thousands of flip flops so this is an example of a pin which is trying to drive a very large load okay how would you handle that ha huh? you need to essentially treat this or one leg of the tree essentially as a chain that needs to be optimized in terms of placement of inverters okay what could you do for example you would have one you would definitely have an usually an inverter but some kind of a buffer right at the beginning which is just the main clock buffer right the input just feeds in there and from there it starts driving the rest of the clock that i might find that i need to put in more inverters here okay and maybe some more inverters over here okay where exactly do you place those inverters how should you do them in such a way that the overall delay is minimized that is also an interesting design problem in itself okay having said that it's not an open research problem because this is something that's been heavily worked on so people know how to do it there are multiple ways by which you do it but it's interesting to know because this is one of the cases where you have a net that needs to drive a very large load and at the same time should have good electrical characteristics typically in any circuit there is one more net which has similar properties it is connected to all the flip flops what is that ha huh? power is of course one thing power is in fact connected to every single gate in the circuit so power is a slightly different issue i'll get to that in a moment there is another thing which is connected to all the flip flops typically what would that be ha huh? reset reset or preset whatever it is that you want right typically in any system you want all your flip flops to start up in a known state which means that usually what you would do is how do we create flip flops we essentially had back to back inverters right if you just power on the system is it going to have a 1 or a 0 at the output you cannot tell not based on the circuit at least which means that you need to have an explicit way of resetting the flip flops to a known state okay in practice there are two ways of doing it right i would have the d input over here clock and i would usually have a reset input coming in here right another way of doing it is that i would have d over here clock but the clock essentially well 
ओके या आई जस्ट गेट टू दैट सेपरेटली वन वे दैट आई कुड इंप्लीमेंट दिस इज टू से दैट आई वुड टेक डी और जीरो and connect the reset as an input before feeding it into a regular flip flop that's one way by which i could do this okay now what is the constraint when i do this when will the flip flop get reset when will the value go to when will the output go to zero at the next clock edge after i make the reset equal to 1 right so this is a so called synchronous reset right where it will go to zero only after the next clock edge right another way of doing it would be that i have a so called asynchronous reset here what would happen is I do not need to wait for the clock edge. I make reset equal to one. Straight away the output goes to zero. Even if the clock is off, doesn't matter whether the clock is running or not. Okay. So that can also be done. Both of these things are available. The asynchronous reset. I mean, even though I have not drawn any additional circuitry around it, it will require some extra work. Typically, what would happen is one of those inverters in the latch would be replaced by an AND gate or something like that. Which allows me to explicitly force its value to a one or a zero by putting a one or a zero at the inverter at the reset input, an AND or an OR gate, right? Depending on whether you want active, high, active, low, and so on. Okay. So there are ways by which you could implement a asynchronous reset, ways by which you can implement a synchronous reset. Both have their pluses and minuses. Both are used in practice extensively, but reset by itself is sort of required for most flip flops. in a circuit at least anything related to the state of a system you need to have a reset associated with it okay but having a reset does add additional circuitry to a flip flop okay so for those of you you know while you while you are looking for the circuit to do for your project you are of course expected to do a flip flop of some sort if some of you are interested you can also look at how you can add reset to the flip flop okay as as an additional thing to look for so the point is reset is also one pin which typically needs to feed the entire circuit okay you do not usually use a reset tree in the same way okay the reason for that is we don't really care about skew and reset it happens once at the beginning of operation of the circuit it should not hopefully happen again while the circuit is operational so as long as you have got it going once you are just set you don't need to worry about skew therefore you do not need to put in all that buffering and the tree and so on you just allow a regular line to sort of go through to all the flip flops and you tell the designer saying that the reset has to be held low for at least so much time or held high for at least so much time in order to completely reset the system you guarantee that way that all skew problems are taken care of okay all right so one other question which had uh, come up in uh, some of the discussions was whether this whole concept of setup time and hold time only comes about because of clock overlap or because of some other structure of the circuit that we are using right that is not necessarily the case the example that i took in class where i sort of estimated the setup time as well as the tcq through one master slave combination right it's just one particular way of analyzing a circuit it turned out that for that particular circuit structure we can do the analysis and at least give an estimate saying that this should be the t setup this should be the t cq and it turns out that for the master slave structure t hold is in fact equal to 0 okay but for any latch there is always going to be a concept of a setup and hold time why is that If you think about it, all that it is related to is the fact that the latch has this property that when there is a clocking signal, some state has to be changed inside the system. Okay, 
and when the clock goes away that state has to be retained what that means is just for its basic functionality some form of feedback will be required inside this circuit okay whether that feedback is explicit as in back to back inverters or implicit as in a charge storage capacitor where also charge storage capacitor actually there is no feedback but that is how the storage is functioning right the storage essentially says that i have now disconnected everything and then that storage is going to hold a value okay so if there is feedback then what happens i could always have a situation where the two sides of the feedback do not agree with each other right so x is going towards zero this is going towards vvd what happens when i close the loop i cannot say okay it doesn't matter whether you make it with transmission gates or with an inverter which is you know using brute force in order to write data into the back to back inverters or a mux or any other kind of structure that you use over there there is always the possibility that these two points x and y are at different values and when you actually join them together they will then settle to something which is in between that is meta stability okay in the case of dynamic latches which do not have this feedback but they have a capacitor that stores the value what happens over there is that you now have the possibility that once again x and y one was trying to charge the capacitor the other was trying to discharge it at the moment that you go into the freeze mode that is disconnect the capacitor it is possible that the data could have been somewhere in between and the capacitor gets stuck at neither zero nor at vvd okay is that the same as meta stability in some sense you know it's you can look at it in a similar way it is not a logic output value because ultimately what is going to happen is that capacitor is going to feed into some other logic gate and come out as a logic value at the end if the capacitor voltage itself is 0.9 volts it is possible that the next stage also goes and gets stuck somewhere around 0.9 volts or will slowly eventually drift to 1 or 0 okay so the problem of meta stability has nothing to do with what kind of flip flop or latch that you implement it is more a basic fact of the idea that you are trying to implement which is that you want to store something even after the controlling signal has been removed okay so please keep that in mind it is you cannot at least not that we know of build a flip flop with zero setup zero hold and zero tcq or at least even zero setup and zero hold any one of them may be possible both together are not in general okay all right so that's pretty much all there is to it uh yeah no the quiz is tomorrow and uh, like i said from friday onwards uh, professor venita will be uh, covering some topics on module level design so starting with adders and moving forward from there okay one last thing there are two courses being offered next semester well three courses uh, for those of you who are interested in those courses just a very quick overview of what they are going to be about right one of them is a course on mapping dsp algorithms to architectures this will be taught by myself as well as professor cb cp ravi kumar from texas instruments okay we'll be sort of sharing the load uh, teaching parts of the course the basic idea of this is dsp signal processing is one major area where a lot of vlsi design is required right and the way that you think about it is you are not really doing transistor level design but design more at a higher level of abstraction how do i actually build systems that do certain kind of signal processing applications right the parts that i will be focusing on will be much more vlsi related in terms of what are the actual implementations and so on plus a number of different ways of representing those algorithms and how you can extract information from that that is useful for the final design dr ravi kumar will also be talking about specific architectures what happens in a dsp what are the kinds of things that are implemented inside dsps what are some specific architectures used for certain kinds of mathematical functions and so on okay so in principle this is not so much a vlsi design course it is more of a digital design in the sense that a slightly higher level of abstraction you are dealing more with modules and system design okay now a closely related course is the vlsi design lab right and 
for the next semester i am actually planning to try out something where i want to link these two together meaning that the assignments in the lab will be related to topics that are being done in the course now i understand that it is not possible to enforce that everybody takes both of them but as far as i am concerned the way that the course will be running will be that the lab will pretty much assume that you are also doing the course the course will assume that you are doing the lab okay in case you have done either one of them before or you already have the background knowledge then you need not register for it but i would strongly recommend that you do if you are planning to register for one then please register for the other one as well okay the lab itself will cover actual implementations of vlsi uh, and vlsi implementations of various kinds of signal processing circuits okay the third course is a topic on advanced topics in vlsi this is more of a slightly generic not generic but advanced course which covers primarily two topics one segment will be on placement and routing algorithms and another part will be on memory design okay both of these segments will be taught by primarily by people from industry as well as in, with a lot of industry experience right in fact uh, the placement and routing algorithms will be taught by uh, shridhar rangarajan from ipi the memory design will be taught by a new faculty who is joining us professor janaki raman as well as uh, rahul rao from ibm okay so there will be a lot of practical insight into how these things are implemented and what are the issues that you come up with in terms of those as far as this particular subject is concerned okay so once again it would be a good follow up for this course if you are interested in taking these courses okay if you have any further questions about this please feel free to contact me by email